Good morning. Welcome, welcome to another day of Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. Sean Isaacs here. I am going to seek to be brief today. My topic is, are you on the right path? Or you can make it more personal. Am I on the right path? Make it more speaking the first person. That's a good question to ask. Because once you know you're on the right path, you can take a lot of the guesswork out. Once you know you're on the right path, you can take a lot of the figuring things out, out of the equation. Once you're sure you're on the right path, there is no need to plan your journey too far ahead. Answers will come in time. Often we seek to figure things out. Maybe you're in the midst of a, uh, an uncertainty right now. Maybe right now you're not clear on some of the things you need to do. You're not sure what steps you need to take. And a lot of times we become paralyzed by uncertainty. We become paralyzed by not being clear on what we need to do. And so what I want to do is encourage you this morning not to spend so much time trying to figure out the future, not to spend so much time trying to figure out what are the steps I should take next. Begin by knowing that you're on the right path. And once you're on the right path, if you're sure you're on the right path, there's no need to plan your journey too far ahead. Answers will come in time. The text that I'm using this morning is uh, Proverbs 4, verse 26, which says, Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Ponder the path of thy feet, the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. I'm going to pray now and ask the Lord for his help this morning. Father, I want to thank you for another day of life. Thank you for your mercies towards me. I can truly and humbly say that I deserve nothing, Lord, but your wrath and your judgment. Uh, there is nothing, Lord, in my hands I bring, as the songwriter says, simply to thy cross I cling. I humble myself in your presence and I ask, O oh God, as you have taught us to pray, I pray that you would forgive me of my debts as I have forgiven those who have trespassed against me. Give me a soft, give me a soft and tender heart, Lord, a willingness to overlook the faults, the sins, the flaws, the weaknesses of others. Give me the wisdom, Father, to examine my own heart, my own life, that I would stand before you in a manner that is right and pure. Your word says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. As I focus this morning, Lord, on not so much figuring out the journey, but the need to be on the right path, I pray that you would grant me wisdom. And for these next 20 minutes, I pray that your word would come to life and that your name would be exalted and that there will be something here that is practical and helpful to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Vicki, good, good morning. It's good to see you. I've been away for a couple days. Um, but anyway, it, it's good to be back in presence. So again, my question this morning, as we think about today's daily nugget of wisdom, today's nugget of wisdom is a question. And the question is, are you on the right path? More specifically or personal, Ask yourself, am I on the right path? Why is this an important thing? Why it's important to know if you're on the right path is because once you know you're on the right path, you don't have to figure anything else out. We spend a lot of time trying to figure out the future, seeking to figure out the next steps. What do I do next? Who should I marry? Where should I go to church? What job should I take? What career do I need to take? What school should my children be going to? What college should they decide to go in? And sometimes we spend a lot of anxiety. We spend a lot of time in a state of anxiety because we're trying to figure out the journey. And we're not to figure out the journey. What we need to figure out is whether or not we're on the right path. And so the goal here is to take a lot of the guesswork out. One of the truths that you'll see in Scripture, if you learn how to read Scripture insightfully, one of the things you'll notice is that God does not give clear direction 
for every step that his people are to take. God keeps us chasing him. God keeps us in a state of dependence. And that's why he says we should pray, give us this day our daily bread. Why? Because the bread yesterday is not sufficient for today. The direction that I received yesterday may not be what I need for today or tomorrow. But you and I can become paralyzed by the need to know the future, by the need to be clear, by the need to know the will of God. Quote, unquote. That's the catchphrase. I need to know God's will in this matter. And what, what tends to happen is instead of us being diligent, being prudent, walking wisely and circumspectly and stepping, we tend to be paralyzed and we, we don't take action. And so the question to answer today is, am I on the right path? Once you know you're on the right path, once you're sure you're on the right path, there's no need to plan your journey too far ahead. Does it mean you don't take some time for preparation? Were it to be like the ant who is, understands how to prepare in the harvest time for the future. But what I'm referring to is the kind of planning that makes us anxious. The kind of planning that causes us to move out of a state of peace and joy. Over and over you and I will see in the scriptures this phrase, especially the New Testament, grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That phrase is found throughout the scriptures. Why is that an important phrase? Number one, because we are needy creatures and we need the grace of God. And grace empowers us to get things done. We are to come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to do what? To help in time of need. So grace is not just the favor of God. Grace helps us in times of need. But not only do we have the, fa the phrase grace or the word grace, we have the word peace. Why? Because not only is the peace of God important, I think what's being asked for by the apostles is that the peace of God would be multiplied in our hearts. See, when you and I are in a state of peace, there's a state of calm. We are better able to make decisions. And what the enemy likes to create, and as, as far as an environment for us, is a state of confusion, discord, uncertainty, lack of clarity. Why? Because if we don't have these things, we make bad decisions. And he understands that the way that God protects you and I, one of the ways, is that when we are on the path, that we make right decisions. But how do you make right decisions? You don't make right decisions by pondering the decisions. You make right decisions by being on the right path. I'll show you what I mean. See, you don't wait until the decision come to figure out what you should do. You need to know God before you need to make decisions. You need to know you're on the right path before the decision arises so that you'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way walk ye in it. If you think about the, the way the Lord directs us through scripture, there doesn't seem to be a lot of time between the decision that needs to be made and the action that needs to be taken. The scripture says things like, Joshua says, listen, I lay before you a path of life and a path of death. Choose next week which path you're going you're to choose. Choose next year whom you're going to serve. No, choose this day. When Joshua stands before the children of Israel, they don't have time to figure out the decision. They need to make it in the moment. And you can say that those who were on the right path, whose hearts were in the right place, made the right decision at that moment. You think of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, God says to Hezekiah, the king, Hezekiah, I want you to get your house in order, for you are going to die. Hezekiah doesn't have time to ponder and figure out the next steps. What does he do? He does what's natural. See, he has developed a prayer life. He has developed communion with God. He has relationship with God. So the natural thing he does is not become depressed by that report. 
He doesn't become discouraged by that report. What, is that? what happens? He is a man of faith, and he asked God to spare his life, and God gave him 15 years. Here's my point. Question, are you on the right path? Why? Because once you're sure you're on the right path, there's no need to plan your journey too far ahead. Answers will come in time. Let me see if I can illustrate this for you and give some scriptures to tie this together in 15 minutes. I want to be done by 8 a.m. I get to work with a lot of business owners and Christian business owners and entrepreneurs. A lot of business owners and entrepreneurs in general. But part of the biggest problem is when I deal with Christians who are business owners and entrepreneurs. And here's what the problem looks like or sounds like. A lot of times I meet God's people who are in careers who are indecisive. They are unable to make decisions. And instead of seeing that as a lack of diligence, they use Christianized language to say, well, I'm waiting on God. I'm trying to determine what God wants me to do. And sometimes when they ask me what they should do, I just say, well, what would you do if you weren't a Christian? What is my point there? Sometimes we can become so religious in the way we think that we forget it's not the standing of the good man that's ordered of the Lord. It is the steps of the good man that's ordered of the Lord. Proverbs 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and delighted, and he delighteth in his way. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Who who? Who does God order their life on the path? Those who take steps, not those who are standing, considering, contemplating, figuring out. So the key is to get on the right path. And once you know you're on the right path, you don't have to spend all the mental, physical, spiritual, emotional energy figuring out the steps. Because the steps of a good man, good woman, are ordered by the Lord. See, now you can rely on the sovereignty of God. See, the sovereignty of God, in my opinion, should not be relied on if you're on the wrong path. If you are on the wrong path, you need to get on the right path. And then you can take comfort in the fact that God is sovereign and he predestines for your good, my good, and his glory what he wants to accomplish. And what do I mean? Again, the text we're looking at is Proverbs 4.26 says, Ponder the path of thy, thy feet and let all thy ways be established. You see what it's saying there? Ponder the path of your feet. Make sure you're on the right path and then your ways, let them be established. Relax. When I see the word let them, the idea is, it's like let patience have its perfect work in you. Let this mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus. When you let something happen, you relax. You're in a state of calm and peace. You don't resist. You don't have to make it happen. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to, to fix it. You just let God do it. But I'm not talking about let go and let God, a passive approach to life that lacks ambition, that lacks diligence. I'm talking about where we should put our energy is making sure we're on the right path. And then the journey will take care of itself. Once you're sure you're on the right path, there's no need to plan your journey too far ahead. Answers will come in time. So what's the wrong path? Well, right here in this text, Proverbs 4, verse 14 says, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Even if I had no other passages of Scripture to help clarify the path to avoid, I would know that I should not, one, enter into the path of the wicked. There is a path that's called the path of the wicked. That's the path I don't want to enter in. But then it says, and go not in the way of evil men. There is a path, and then there is a way. There's a path. When I think of path, I think of a place to walk. When I think of way, I think of a journey. Right? The Bible says, broad is the way that leads to death. Narrow is the way that leads to life. 
Linda says, Linda, I always like to read your comments. I can't give people what I have, but I can share my experience. In the calm and quiet of the morning, before the business of the day begins, no matter what it is, I ask God to fill me with the Holy Spirit and to guide my steps and actions and read or listen to Scripture. Very good, young... I was going to say young lady. You are a young lady. Right? Very good, Linda. You're right on. See? The Bible says in Proverbs 3, Trust in the Lord. Uh, lean not on your own understanding. And in all of our ways, we are to acknowledge Him and He will direct our path. See, we get on the right path. God directs the path. But what is our responsibility? To trust in the Lord and lean not on our own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all of our ways. So that's exactly what you said. You start your day with prayer, and you ask God, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. That's a command of Luke chapter 11. Every child of God should be asking God to fill him with your Spirit. If we be e being evil, not give good gifts to our children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? What does the Holy Spirit do? John 14 through 16, he leads and guides us into all truth, right? So I don't have to figure it out because he's the guider. He's the leader. What I need to do is make sure I'm on the right path. And one of the ways to do that, you're totally correct, Linda, is the way we start our day, right? And this is why I always say, I don't know how God's people, there are a lot of people who say, I'm not a morning person. I understand. I'm not a morning person. Uh, so they do most of their praying at night. And I don't know how you can pray, give us this day our daily bread, lead me today, not into temptation, deliver me today, not from evil. And I don't know how you can pray the Lord's Prayer, quote unquote, unless you're praying for tomorrow. I don't know how to pray it effectively without praying the morning before I begin my day. This is why I have a morning ritual. And every child of God, you should have a morning ritual. You should have things that you do every morning to set you up for success, to prepare you for success. And it sounds, Linda, like you have that. You said, so before you start the business day or it begins, no matter what it is, I ask God to fill me with it, with the Holy Spirit and to guide my steps and actions. And, right, and that's the prayer. Lead me not into temptation, deliver me from evil. You're asking for guidance. And I read or listen to scripture. I think a misconception is that a lot of time is required for this, but it isn't. A lot of people suffer needlessly with anxiety. You are so filled with wisdom, Linda. That is so true. And a lot of times our anxiety is because we need to, we're trying to figure out the journey. And again, you got to understand your personality, difference, or trait. Some people, because of the way they are wired, they need to know everything in advance before they take actions. They need to figure everything out in advance before they take action. That person makes a good accountant. They're good at numbers. They're very analytical generally. They're good at writing business plans because they have, they have a level of prudence and, and circumspection in their own hearts, the way they think that they're able to foresee of all the possible things that can go wrong and plan ahead. That's desperately needed in our world. But when you come to the cross, when you come to the journey of walking with God, we all have a level equal playing field. God makes no exceptions for our personalities because the Holy Spirit makes up for those weaknesses. The Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, and faith. Nine, ninefold fruit. It's not fruits. It's one fruit with nine parts. It's like an orange, right? An orange has all those plugs. That's how the fruit of the Spirit is. Don't think of the fruit of the Spirit as nine fruits. Well, I, you know, I have the peace of, of the Spirit, but I, you know, I lack gentleness. Don't be comfortable with that. We don't have to have it all in its fullness. Only Christ was given the Holy Spirit without measure. But we should have a measure of the ninefold fruit in our life if we are a child of God. Okay? If I am loving, but I lack self-control or temperance, then maybe my loving nature is more my personality, not the Spirit of the Lord in operation in my life. Sometimes we don't know how to distinguish between what's my, what's, what's my natural bent or propensity and what, is my, and what is the power of the Spirit of God operating in my life. 
All right, so back to our question because I have six minutes. So are you on the right path? That's the question to ask this morning. Am I on the right path? Once you're sure you're on the right path, there's no need to plan your journey too far ahead. Answers will come in time. Answers will come in time. A lot of times, me and my wife, she, I don't know, I, 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 we have conversations all the time about stuff. And I, my simple answer would be, I don't know. She asked me something right before I started this daily nugget of wisdom today. And it was about um, somebody we may need to, we're supposed to meet on Saturday. And we're thinking we may not be able to do it. And she, you know, it's natural. She wants to plan ahead. She wants to figure things out and know what we're going to do on Saturday. And I'm not sort of easy-go-lucky kind of a guy. I'm just, I don't spend a lot of energy figuring out too many things. I said, you know what, let's pray about it and we'll see how the Lord directs us. And that's not religion for me. It's just become a part of the way I'm trying to walk with God. Acknowledge Him in all your ways. Not some. All thy ways. And what will happen? He will direct your path. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. Acknowledge God in everything. Everything. It doesn't have to be long. An acknowledgement is, I'm just letting you know, I'm weak, Lord. I'm not clear. I don't, I'm not omniscient. I don't know everything. I don't have all power. I may not be sure, so I'm trusting you to direct me. All right? So there's a path to, to avoid, and then in this text, there's a part, path to embrace. Proverbs 4.13, The path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Do you see the insight of God's word? Do you see how this idea is found in scripture? That once you're sure you're on the right path, there's no need to plan your journey too far ahead. Why? Because the path of the just is as a shining light, and it gets brighter and brighter. It gets more clear as you stay on the path. God guides, leads, directs by his spirit, and you walk with a sense of confidence. You walk with a sense of authority. You don't need to figure everything out because you know your father has it all planned out. He's in total control. What do I need to do? My responsibility is to make sure I'm on the right path. Make sure I'm walking with him. Make sure I'm being led by him. Make sure I'm praying for his guidance, his direction, his wisdom, his strength, his power. And then I let him do the rest. And if you do that, grace and peace will be multiplied. And you'll have a sense of calmness as you walk through this broken, sin-sick world where Jesus says, the scripture says, save yourself from this crooked and perverse generation. In the book of Acts, all right? So there's a path to avoid, a path to embrace. So why should we get on the right path? Two quick reasons. Number one, the longer we're on the wrong path, the harder it is to get off. Why should we get on the right path? Because the longer we have habits of being in the wrong path, the harder it is to get on the right path. This is practical in so many ways, right? I've often met young people who have grown up in church. And, and the mindset is, well, when I get older, I will get serious about spiritual things. I'm not ready yet. And I said, you know, you may get saved later. I don't know. That's foolish. It's presumptuous to think you are going to, to be saved later. Tomorrow's not promised to anyone. But let's just say that God, because of the prayers of your parents, because of, of, of the prayers of your grandparents, great-grandparents, because God is not a God of, 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 of one. God is a generational God. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I believe I am saved today because of my great-great-great-grandparents who prayed for my salvation. My great-great-grandfather was blind in his 90s. As a young child, I would look at him rocking in his chair. I thought he was a crazy old man. I now have come to understand that he was praying for hours. So God is a God of generations. But just because he's a God of generations doesn't mean Sean should, should wait until he's 22. He's grown up in church all his life. Wait until he's 22. He gets serious about eternal things after the death of his oldest brother. The stupidest, dumbest thing I could do. Why? Because living that path of unrighteousness for 22 years, there are habits that I developed Wicked things sown in my heart and soul and mind that still dwell within my members, Romans 6. 
And now my body still remember the taste of sin. And so the struggle and the fight against sin is stronger. Why? Because the longer you stay on the wrong path, the harder it is to stay or to get on the right one. It is unwise to wait to seek the Lord. Scripture says, seek him while he may be found. There comes a point when he can't be found. We should seek him while he may be found. That's a word for your children and others you may know that are not walking with God today. So two quick questions again. The longer we are on the wrong path, the harder it is. Two quick statements to get off. Lastly, since you and I are told to ponder the path of our feet, it tells us that there are many ways that are wrong, but only one that's right. People say things like, you know, all roads lead to heaven. You know, I met a Muslim guy about two weeks ago. We were talking. And, uh, you know, you ever met, meet someone and they just want you to be okay that we're all on the right path, even though we're serving different, uh, you know, we have different paths, but we're all headed in the right, the journey is, the, the end is the same. And it's almost like we're having a conversation and he wants me to be okay with, you know, just leave me alone. Uh, you know, I'm a religious person, you're a religious person. And I just, I'm like, and he's like, you know, I believe in Jesus, you believe in Jesus. I'm like, you believe in Jesus? Yeah. I said, but, but how do you believe in Jesus? I said, the problem, the difference between you and I is you believe Jesus was a great man, a great prophet, just like many prophets. He's like, yes. I said, so what made a prophet a prophet? They spoke truth. Good. You believe Jesus' words? Yeah, sure. And he thinks that's going to that's gonna, gonna pacify me and cause me to go, all right, let's just have a good time together. We're all on the right journey, right path. I said, well, simple question. Jesus says, I am the way, truth, and life. No one can come to the Father except by me. Without the way, there's no going. Without the truth, there's no knowing. Without the life, there's no living. And Jesus makes a statement that is so dogmatic that either it is true or he was a lunatic. Because he didn't say, I can show you the way. I can point you to the truth. And I can show you how to receive life. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. There is no room for understanding in Jesus' words. There's no place of unity there with anyone else. Right? Every other religion wants to embrace Christ in some way. Christianity doesn't embrace any other religion, any other faith, or any other prophet. The Mormon believes in Jesus. The Jehovah's Witness believes in Jesus. The Christian scientist believes in Jesus. The Muslim believes in Jesus. The issue is, who do you believe Jesus is? See, the question is not whether people believe in God. That's not, that's not the question to answer. The question to answer is the one that Jesus asked his followers. Who do men say that I am? And then who do you say that I am? It has to be personal. Who am I to you? Thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of the Living God. Right? To say he was the Son of God to the Jew meant that he was God. That's why they said it's blasphemy, right? The privilege of being a son of God is a huge privilege. Maybe someday I'll talk more about it, right? To be a child of God is a huge privilege. Angels are not children of God. For you and I to be called a child of God, 1 John says, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God or the children of God. Huge benefit. Well, my time is gone. I'm three minutes over. Let me give you these last few verses. Again, are you on the right path? That's the thing you want to think about today. Forget about trying to figure out all the other stuff. If you know you're on the right path, if you know you are right with God, you've confessed your sins to Him, you have acknowledged Him in, in, in your ways, relax. Don't figure out what house you need to buy, where it needs to be bored, where you need to live, what job, should I leave this job? Don't do any of that. Because the path of the just is like a shining light. And it gets brighter and brighter on the path. The, the fact that it gets brighter and brighter shows that it's not... When we get on the path, we don't have enough light to see where we're going. That tells us we're in a state of dependence. The path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The end of the journey is the perfect day. Along the path, the light gets brighter. So, a few passages... To meditate on. Proverbs 4.13. Proverbs, I'm sorry, 22.11. The psalmist says, 
Psalm 22, 11, teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. You and I have three major enemies in this world. You know, there are blacks who think their enemies are whites. There are whites who think their enemies are blacks. There are Jews who think their enemies are Germans. There are Germans who believe their enemies are Jews. There are people in Afghanistan that believe their enemies are people in Palestine. Uh, the people in Palestine that believe they're, and you get the point. That's not your enemy. Yeah, in, in, this, in one sense of the word, you can have a physical enemy. But according to scripture, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So our enemies are, number one, ourself. That's the, huge, the biggest enemy that you and I have is ourselves. We can be our biggest blessing and biggest curse. Self. Jesus says in John 16, the prince of this world has come and he's found nothing in me. See, it didn't matter what temptation the devil put before Jesus. There's nothing in Jesus to draw out lust or temptation. That's why we're to put to death stuff within ourselves. Because the more we kill sin within us, as one writer says, I must always be killing sin or sin will be killing me. First enemy is myself. Sin that dwells within my members. Second enemy is the world. The world is not passive, and I'm not talking about the world of people, I'm talking about the system of this world, which creates pressure to the child of God to conform to the world. Second enemy is the world. Third enemy is the devil. Those are our three enemies. The psalmist says, teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in the plain path because of my enemies. I want to be led in the plain path, which is the just path, the right path, because I have enemies, I don't want to trust myself. Second text of scripture, very popular one for most of God's people. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my journey. No, a light unto my path. Again, once you're sure you're on the right path, there's no need to plan your journey too far ahead. Answers will come in time. Last text is Psalm 119, 35. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments. You hear what the psalmist is praying? Make me to go. Make me to go. People say God doesn't make us do stuff. What Bible do you read? We have free will. We can do whatever we want. Yeah, but God also can make us do stuff. He made Saul of Tarsus follow him. How? By knocking him off his high horse, humbling him, blinding him, and causing him to say, okay, whatever you want me to do. He made Isaiah become a missionary. He did, yeah, Isaiah chapter 6. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. When the glory of God filled the temple, it humbled Isaiah. And he said, okay, Lord. God says, who's going to go for us? Isaiah says, here I am. I'm going. I'll be the missionary. Jonah. God made Jonah to do his will. How do you do it? It took a little time. He caused the fish to open his mouth and swallow him. And then he got Jonah's attention. God made me follow him. How did he do it? He took my oldest brother. Yep. Uh-huh. It was through the death of my oldest brother that my, tw my twin brother and I came to the Lord. So the way God makes us do things is not by force. It's often by influence. But he'll get his purposes accomplished. He'll get his will done. He can be done the hard way or the easy way. The psalmist says, I want the easy way. He says, teach me thy way, O Lord, which shows there's a process. Teach me thy way, which shows there's a level of dependence, which shows the, the psalmist is humble and teachable. Some people have been a Christian too long. They're not teachable anymore. They can't learn anything unless it's learned the way they think it should come. See, when the psalmist says, teach me thy way, he doesn't tell God how to teach him. God uses all sorts of things to teach us. He can use animals. We can gain wisdom from the ant. He can use friends. Iron sharpens iron. He can use the Holy Spirit by a voice, by a dream, by a vision. God has no limits. The psalmist puts no qualifications here. He just says, teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. He understands there are three major enemies for him, and he doesn't want to be led astray. He can be his worst enemy by leaning on his own understanding and not acknowledging God. All right, so I hope you found something here helpful. Are you on the right path? 
are you on the right path? Once you're sure you're on the right path, there's no need to plan your journey too far ahead. Answers will come in time. Answers will come. Why? Because God orders the steps of his people. So just start stepping. Start walking. Keep trusting. And watch God direct your life. Guys, have a great day today. As usual, I like to hear any feedback. And uh, Allison, Darshel, good to see you. Um, sorry I missed you guys yesterday and I think Friday. Uh, I did a little something on Sunday. I don't think I did anything Saturday. Uh, it's been a full weekend for me. I was traveling um, yesterday. But um, I'm back. All right. So hope you guys are well. And uh, if you missed a portion of this day's nugget, I want to encourage you. I think there's a lot of good insight here. And I don't, not because I spoke it. It's because I believe God answered my prayer to provide us food. Right? Give us this day our daily bread. Have a good day, guys. Remember, once you're sure you're on the right path, once you're sure you're on the right path, there's no need to plan your journey too far ahead. Answers will come in time. That's how God directs. He never gives us everything we need because we need to stay dependent as his children. Be blessed.